I know that we all go through seasons where we feel like we, we just don't have enough. What we have simply isn't enough. If, if Even if you won the lottery last night, this morning you'll probably wake up and start thinking, that isn't enough, what I just made. The, the prize I got last night isn't enough. You start realizing how much they actually tax you from the, from the reward, from the winnings. And so you start thinking, oh, now i got to pay that too. That's just not, not enough. Uh, there was a, a TV show uh, of this woman that will remain... Uh, uh, we won't name her this morning, but it was a TV show where she just gave out everybody, the whole crowd, cars. And she said, and you get a car, and you get a car, and you get a car. And the whole crowd went crazy, and they all said, yes, yes, and they got all excited. A few months later, they were suing her and the show because they knew that they had to pay taxes on each one of those cars. And they were saying, whoa, 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 I didn't sign up for all this. And so, see, there's moments in our life, or it seems like it seems all the time, we feel like we don't have enough right now. Whatever we have doesn't seem like you have enough. Now, you might also have not, not just a physical need, but a great big need in and, and around you. But all around you, all you see is, is scarcity. All you see is nothing around you. You feel maybe at times personally, as you're hearing these messages about greater things, about changing the world, about making an impact, about... In a time such as this, God has called you. You were born to be alive in 2019. In a time in which there is so much need, you were born for this hour. The Lord has has is is about to use you to do all of this. And you might say, I'm not good enough. I'm not ready enough. I don't I don't have enough resources to do that. Uh, It sounds good for you to say that, Pastor, but I have never been trained. I don't I don't know my Bible, Genesis through Revelation. I don't I, 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 I don't I I'm not good enough for this, God. How is it that you want me to do all this? You don't, you feel like you don't have, uh, uh, enough, enough of who you are. You just, you're just not good enough. Or you might even hear and be listening to the lies of the enemy telling you, you're not good enough. Why do you think you could do this? How dare you think that you could do this? How dare you think that God could use you? You have been such a sinner. You have been, you have been so disobedient to him in the past. And you really think that God is willing to use you? You're not good enough. There's others. Let others do it. Not you. You shouldn't be willing to do this. And so you might start listening to those lies and start feeling like you're not enough. All of us, we might feel like we don't have enough time. Amen. We don't have enough time to do this. I know God, this is what you want me to do, but I got to take care of my family. I got to take care of my job. I have responsibilities. I, I don't have time to do these, these great things that you're calling me to do. We don't have enough money. Maybe that could be the excuse. Uh, uh, the Lord says, go, go, go to your city. Uh, bless your city. Bless the, the nation. Bless, bless the people around the world. Go, go on a missions trip. Go serve around the world. And you're thinking, I don't have enough money. I don't have enough time to do this. But before we go today to today's scripture, I want to give you already point number one this morning. And point number one today is no matter what need you have, God cares and God provides. No matter what need it is, God does care. God does provide for you. I personally have seen this to be true time and time again. Over and over, I have seen God provide where there shouldn't be provision, where there shouldn't be uh, a way out of that need, God simply provides, whether it's through people, whether it's simply miracles, whether, whether it's simply uh, uh, maybe something that you might need, whether it's, it's a sickness and the Lord provides health, whether it's a physical, financial need, the Lord provides the finances to get out of that one. And I think that all of us, when we look back in our life, we start remembering, I remember that moment, and I remember that moment, and God took care of me there, God took care of me there. But sometimes we see things in our lives that seem, they seem so small. And, and we simply wonder, does God even care about this? Does, should I even pray about this? Uh, should I even bother God with this? When I watch movies or, or TV shows and they talk about God, uh, I hear that all the time. People say that. They, they'll say, uh, why would you bother God with that? Why would you even bring that to God? He's so busy with other 
quote, real needs? Why should you be, why should you be praying and asking Him for help with that? And so I think we have this distorted understanding of God's heart, of who He is and what He cares for. But this morning, again, there is nothing too small for God. He does care about that need. Then we, we sometimes see a problem and see it so big that it becomes our focus and our whole life revolves around that one problem. And it seems like we wake up, if we even fell asleep, because we're so worried and stressed about it, we wake up and we're just, we're, we go right back to thinking about that problem. And we go back to thinking about that need and we're just, we're just worried and worried. And, and, and uh, we, we don't even eat. We're, we're, just, we're just so worried. Some, some of us will, will eat more because we're worried about the problem. And then we're, we're going throughout the day and, 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 and uh, it's affecting you at work and it's affecting your, your relationships and you're just worried about that problem and your whole life revolves around it and, and you believe that no one and nothing can get you out of it that even God has left you, that you just feel like, how is this happening right now? It seems like one thing is happening after the other, and you're just looking at your life, and you're like saying, God, you must have left me. I'm, I'm done praying about this. I'm, it's too much. But again, there's nothing too small, and there's nothing too big for our God who does care, who does provide. Who, who, whoever in this room knows this, may you just simply say amen this morning. If you believe that God cares about you, why? Because you have seen it happen. You have seen it that God does provide for you, does help you, does care. So let's meet this, this woman this morning in this, in this story. We're going to go back to Elisha. And he meets this woman. And here at the beginning of, of the first verse, in the first verse of chapter 4 of 2 Kings, we get to meet this woman. And it says... And it says this, she was the wife of a man from the company of the prophets, cried out to Elisha, your servant, my husband is dead, she says to Elisha. And you know that he revered the Lord, but now his creditor is coming to take my two boys as his slaves. Sometimes we go through our day and we don't even realize the problems that people might have around us. We might go to the grocery store, we're at the checkout counter, and we're, and we're, 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 we're paying for whatever we have, and we tell the, the, the lady behind the counter, and we say, hey, how are you? Oh, no, good, thank you, how are you? We're doing good, all right, have a nice day, see you later. And we just walk away, not knowing that they're going, their whole life is, is upside down, and that they are in such need of God, that God needs to move in their life, or else they're just, their whole life falls apart. And so... So there's a lot of things happening with people all around us that we don't even know. But as far as this woman goes, she was not too prideful to come to Elisha, to come to God's representative and ask him for help. She simply opens up. She simply begins to tell Elisha and and was honest with all of her needs. Now, here she is, as we just read, in this huge crisis because because of something she never expected would happen. Now, the story tells us that her husband was dead. And as we read this, her husband was part of Elijah's prophetic ministry. Elijah led other prophets, and one of them was the husband of this man. He, he was probably training him and ministering with him. And some Bible scholars believe that this this woman, uh, we don't even have a name for this woman. Uh, the Bible sometimes doesn't name specific people. Uh, most of the time it is women. Culturally at the time, women, uh, they just didn't hold a, a, a respectable position in society, so, so they wouldn't name them specifically. But more than that, I truly believe that sometimes some people in the Bible are not named because God wants us to place ourselves in those stories, to place ourselves in those in those characters, in those moments, so that we could recognize that this is us. This is us here. This is us in this middle of this problem. And so her husband is, is, is not only dead, but he also left a debt. That debt did not die with him. He left a debt that now she had to worry to pay off. So she has to provide for herself and her sons, but also she can't pay 
uh, uh, her, what her husband owes. So a great crisis. And so she is just worried. She is stressed out. She, she, she knows that, that this, this is a huge problem for her life. And so, but they say that the, the, the scholars, the historians, the ones that study the Bible, they've said that this could have been simply the wife of the prophet Obadiah. And, and uh, in 1 Kings, we hear about this man, Obadiah. And it makes sense because um, he actually uh, financially helped out over 50 prophets, uh, many prophets. He spent his resources to help uh, uh, many prophets, and, and he was blessing them and helping them. So out of the little that he had, he provided for their ministry. And so, so he probably spent all of his resources on helping God's work. And so as he does that, then later on in the story, he does pass away. But now he has left this problem to his wife. Now picture this young woman that, again, historians say she was probably in her early 30s. Her husband has passed away, and in her culture, she was not able to provide for herself. Once a husband dies, once you are a widow, that's why the Lord calls us to take care of widows. In that culture, once you're a widow, you, you cannot even work for yourself. You, you either rely on your son, on your firstborn son, or if you don't have a firstborn son and you are, and you are a widow, then you go with your husband's uh, brother, and you become his wife. And so then you go live with, with your brother-in-law. And if you don't have that, as the story of Ruth goes, the story of Naomi, Naomi had nothing left. She knew that she would end up as a homeless woman. Many women ended up on the streets because they did not have men to take care of them and they could not work for themselves. This is what she thought was going to happen to her. Because the only way that she could provide for herself is by selling herself physically. And she knew that she would not do this. This was not something that she would do. And now her creditors, the ones that he owed, are coming to take not only what she owed, but because the culture would say that if you can't pay it off, then you have to go work it off. And she couldn't do it herself, so they were going to take her two sons as slaves and so they would be slaves and, and stay slaves until they pay it off. And, and usually that never happened. You would just be a slave for the rest of your life or until the 50th year, which was called the year of Jubilee, in which it was a tradition that you would simply uh, uh, pay off or just, or just uh, cancel all the debt that anyone had. So if there were slaves that, that were in debt, when we think of slavery today, slavery, we th usually think of forced slavery, Europeans forcing Africans to become slaves. That's what we usually think of. But in Scripture, in the biblical times, it was more of, I owe you something, so let me work for it, and I become your slave. Well, this is what was going to happen to these boys, to, to, to these sons, she really had no hope. Uh, uh, she had a, a true, real, significant need. She seriously had not enough. And so here she finds herself and she is ready to give up, but she knows that she could find help from Elisha because she knew that he served God. Now think about those small needs in our lives that, that just, just ruin our day. The, the, the little things that we just, they just ruin our day. They just become such a big deal, even though they're small things. Someone cuts you off on the freeway. Someone gets in front of you. Someone doesn't go on green when the light turns green and they don't, and you're hurt and you're late to work or late somewhere and just move already. Come on. And it just messes up your day. Uh, I, I, I'm not going to see anybody pointing fingers or, or nudging anybody next to you. But, or, or someone didn't hold the door open for you. Someone looked at you weird at work. Someone, someone spoke to you rudely. Um, someone, uh, or maybe the line uh, at, 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 at the store is, is just taking so long. Well, so, well, they just hurry up. Why don't they open more, more registers? And we're just looking around. And, and, or someone messes up your Starbucks drink. And, 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 and you're just, uh, oh, my day is ruined. And it seems like sometimes the small little things just ruin our day. But this story should remind us that we're doing okay. <laughs> that, that we're doing okay. But, but I think a lot of us can still relate to her because some of us might have a great need that you're thinking of right now. 
Uh, I don't have enough, you might be saying. I don't have enough to get out of this. I have a broken relationship right now. My marriage is not doing okay. My, my, my relationship with my children is not good. Uh, you, you might have a, a real huge financial need. The bills are just stacking up at home. Uh, there might be a sickness in your body or in your family. And it's just, it's just causing your whole life to revolve around this problem. Or you're simply in a season in which you're praying to God, Lord, open a door, but all you keep finding is just dead ends in your life. And you're just hoping, God, I, I need to get out of this situation and, and nothing is helping. But again, no matter what need you have, does God, God does care and God will provide. He does. He simply does. Hold on to that point this morning. Hold on to that truth. Because sometimes that's all that's going to help you to get out of that storm. Sometimes you're there in the middle of the storm and it's just believing. You don't see anything that, that will somehow uh, uh, give you an answer. You might not see anything that seems like a little bit of light at the end of this darkness. You don't see it at all. But you're holding on to, in faith to Jesus, believing that He has control. And He will provide and He will heal and He cares. Sometimes it's just simply the love of God that will help you to get through this situation. It's simply the Father's love that will help you to keep waking up and going another day, even though everything around you seems to say the opposite of that. But it is His love that keeps us going. But then in verse 2, look what Elisha says to her. Elisha replied to her, verse 2, How can I help you? Tell me, what do you have in your house? Your servant, she says, has nothing there at all, she said, except a small jar of olive oil. Think about, about like, and as far as, far as small, I'm thinking something, let me see, I have something here. I mean, it's like this little, little jar of olive oil. I mean, like, probably like, I'm thinking a little Gerber jar, a little, little baby food jar, and, and something so small, and she's saying, this is all I got. And, and, well, so I really technically have nothing. Now, when you don't have what you want, when you don't have what you want, what you think you want, you find out that it's exactly what God wants in your life at that moment. In other words, when you don't, have anything around you, you realize that it's God, the one you really need. When you don't have anything that gets you out of that need, like I said earlier, sometimes it's only God's love that will sustain you. And so that is exactly what you needed all along, because we recognize that He is our source. Again, it's not the miracle, it's not the provision, it's not anything of that, but it is God Himself. When He is our source, anything is possible. God is the owner of all the resources on heaven and earth. He holds everything in His hands. So when we rely and trust in Him, we trust in the Creator of the universe. It is all His. It all comes from Him. Now, she comes to Elisha, believing that God can do something through Elisha. And Elisha doesn't walk away from the situation. He, he doesn't say, uh, okay, okay, lady, I'll, I'll, I'll pray for you. <laughs> I'll be praying for you. God bless you. And then he walks away from the situation. That could have been easy. That could have been something he could have done. But no, he stops and he asks her. And he asks her something very practical. And he says, how can I help you? How, okay, let me stop right now and let me ask you, how can I help you? We should try this more often in our life. When someone comes to us in need, when someone comes to us and simply shares with us their need, rather than us simply saying, okay, I'll be thinking about you, I'll be praying for you, we should stop and ask, okay, well, you tell me, how can I help you? That's something that I learned from my, from my pastor, uh, just following him in ministry, because sometimes uh, I think that people come and they, they simply bring all of their needs to the pastor, and, and, and uh, simply uh, they think of him more of a, of a, 
of some kind of, of priest which in which you're just simply confessing all your needs and then you just kind of walk away and you just kind of like vomit out all the problems and all the needs and all the, and all the, the stuff that's happening and then you just kind of walk away. And then now pastor is now having to carry all the problems. But I, what I loved about the pastor is that he would always tell him, okay, that's great. Um, how can I help you though? What do you need me to do? Oh, well, well, uh, well, maybe you could just pray about it. I'll pray for you if that's all you want. Well, no, well, my, my family needs, needs some, some clothes right now. Okay, we'll get you that. Okay, we could, we could figure that out. What else do you need? Uh, maybe, maybe some food. Okay, okay, we'll take care of that too. And, and that's simple. Because sometimes I, get, I think we get so spiritual that we never end up helping. <laughs> that we end up, never end up doing the, the, the simple, uh, uh, practical things we need to do. And so I love that Elisha simply said, what do you need and how can I help you? Now, God is, is about to use Elisha because why? Because Elisha, he made himself available. He simply said, God, use me right now. He simply said, how can I help you? God, use me to help you. Imagine if we simply prayed that every morning. God, I pray today that, you're, that, that, that you simply help me to be available to someone. Show me the needs around me and use me to be your presence to people. Use me to be your hands and feet and your voice to people around me every single day. If we woke up that, that way every morning, you know what the Lord will do? He will use us. Our, uh, these doors will begin opening around us because when we become available, God uses those that are available. When we simply make excuses about why we can't help and serve, then he'll find someone else to help and serve. Because, because we're simply making excuses to say why God can't use us and so he will simply keep going. But God will use you when we simply are available. Now, this is where following Jesus, I love this story because this is where following Jesus becomes now an adventure. It's so much more than just religion. It's so much more than, than, than something boring on a Sunday, that, that just the traditions and the rituals. No, this is an adventure. This is, this is fun. This is great. And so watch how God will use you and begin to bless you and, and, and use you to be a blessing, to be Jesus to someone. Now, then Elisha, instead of just giving her a handout, because again, he could have just given her, given her some money and said, well, I could help you out. Maybe well, here's a few coins. Maybe this helps out, at least for the next day. No, he asked her, what do you have? Okay, what do you have right now? Do an inventory, woman, of your own life. What do you have of your in your house right now? What resources do you have right now in your hands? Now, let's trust God to meet your needs with the resources that you already have. Now, notice again how she responds. She says, I have nothing. She said, I have nothing at all except a small jar of olive oil. When we have a need, we only notice the stuff we don't have. When we have a need, we begin to notice, I don't have this, I don't have this, I don't have this. But then when we stop and we realize, wait a minute, I do still have this, 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 and this. These things are still around us. That's why I said at the end of the year, at the end of 2018, I shared with you, before we go into the next year and before we see the needs in front of us, we need to stop and do an inventory of our life and see all the blessings that we do have. All the things that we can still hold on to and, you, and, and let, allow God to use because He has blessed us with these things. And sometimes we're just so focused on what we don't have that we don't realize that God does have something there for us to use. And, and, and so we just simply begin to see all, all, all the problems. It seems like uh, someone else's uh, lawn is always greener, right? The grass is always greener for someone else. It seems like, like uh, uh, you start seeing your relationship, your spouse, and you start thinking, well, that's not as nice as their relationship. Uh, uh, you've been looking at someone else's Facebook or Instagram page, and you're looking at them, and you're, ah, oh, they just look so perfect. And then I got my husband over here, my wife over here. And so we start seeing the grass a little bit greener somewhere else. And, and we start thinking maybe theirs is better. Their house is nicer. Their cars are nicer. Their clothes are nicer. And look at what I have. And we start thinking, I, I, I just don't have enough. I don't have the, the best house. I don't have the, the best car. I don't have uh, good enough things. And, and we go into our closet, right? Right, ladies? You go into your closet and you look at it. And what do you say? I don't have nothing to wear. And some guys, too. 
And we say we don't have nothing to wear. And, and it's just, uh, or, or maybe we just look at our church sometimes and we say we don't have a big enough church, we don't have big enough buildings. Sometimes we could look around our church and think about what we don't have. We, we don't have uh, uh, this ministry or that ministry or we don't have uh, uh, the programs or the, or the things or the, the musicians or instruments or the things that other churches have. And it seems like we could focus on those things that we don't have. And we get a little bit frustrated and we think that, that just God can't. And, and then we begin to uh, believe those lies that God simply can't get us out of this situation. But when we realize that God is alive in our church, when we realize that God is real, that we might not have anything, but we have God, that's all that matters. If we had it all, if we had all the riches in heaven, we still wouldn't be happy. But if God wasn't there, then it would all be a waste. If we, were, if we had the greatest building and it was packed out with 100,000 people, with the best musicians and best singers and best preachers and the best programs and everything, but God was not there, then we should just turn everything off and go home. But this morning we're here and we know that the presence of God is here and that's what matters. Because when you have Him... That's all that matters because the mission of the church is not about buildings, it's not about programs, it's about the gospel. That's what the mission of the church is. And so for us to simply start focusing, I've heard pastors say, I just, I just know that if we build a building, I know if I just, uh, this is our vision, this is our mission. And, and when you ask them, what's your mission statement? And our mission statement is that we're going to build a building. And we're going to build a building. And, and, and every sermon and everything's about the building. And, and, and I've seen this with pastors, sadly, or churches. They build the building, they have the building, and, and they're excited, but there's no one to fill the building. And then they finally build the building, and a few months later, a, 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 later, a few years later, it's, it's gone. The church is closed, and the building is there, left empty. When you go to the Bay Area, they won't let you build buildings anymore. Mostly because of, yeah, yeah, liberal, but whatever. But, but also because they're just tired of seeing uh, uh, churches build buildings, build property, and leaving them empty after a few months. So they just won't allow you to build buildings anymore. Because, the, 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 again, the mission of the church is not buildings, it's not things, it's not material things. It is the gospel of Jesus. So if we go and we have a tent, if we go and we have a, if we have a, 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 a generator and a microphone, if we just have our voice to shout, if we, just, if we just still have our hands to clap and our voice to sing, then that's all we need. If we go to the highways and byways, the scripture says, we will go everywhere. And we simply will share the gospel because that's what it's about. Now, so in our, in, in, in our need, though, there, why does God allow these things to happen? Why does God allow us to go in need? Because we are so simple that it's in our need that we begin to start thinking and get out of our comfort and we start noticing, okay, what do I need to do? All right, what is it that I need to do to get out of this problem? Just in the business world, in, in, in the business world, it is need that makes the, great, the greatest innovations. That, that there's businesses, that there's inventors, that there's, that there's people in technology that, that have simply said, okay, there is a need here that I need to fill. And they go in their garages, and they go into their offices, into their factories, and they start figuring out ways to meet that need. And then they figure it out, and then they just become billionaires. Now, when we look at our church, and, and we begin to see uh, just a few years ago, we're looking and we're thinking, wow, here we are. There's, there's, there's four of us. There's six of us. Maybe ten of us on a good Sunday. Okay, great. Well, what do we need to do? It's in that discomfort. It's in the, 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 the bank account. Just, just that almost going negative. And there's moments where you're looking at it and you're thinking, okay, God, how are we going to pay the bills next month? How are we going to be able to do this and this? And, and okay, what do we need to do? All right, we need to create relationships with some other churches. Maybe they come and rent. We have buildings. That's what we have. Maybe they could come and rent. Then they come and then they, they're not only renting, but then we, we create relationships with them and we become uh, we, we ministry partners and we start serving 
serving the community. And, and while, while His Way Community Church was here with us a, a, a couple years ago, there, that became such a strong relationship. And, and here comes Koala and I who don't know anybody in Stockton. And, and, and through Pastor Tyson and the other ministers, we were able to make, create community with the rest of this city and, and create relationships. And, 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 uh, and it encouraged us. And of course, it helped us financially, but it moved us forward spiritually. And, and as we create relationships with the other churches that are renting from us, or, or maybe simply people that come and, and, and have a birthday party in the, in the gymnasium, or we rent it out to somebody for a wedding or something, in, in our need, it is creating in us uh, uh, this, this imagination, this innovation, this, this what can we do to continue the ministry of the work of God. And as we do that, He is challenging us, He is making us grow, He is maturing us, and He is helping us to move forward. Because sometimes in our comfort, we simply lay back. We sit back and we say, oh, well, I'm just going to, I'm just going to rest on what I have. And as the years, the years and the decades could go back and you simply lay back and you don't realize that God has greater things for you. So it's sometimes in the need, sometimes even in the sickness, in the problem, that it allows you to, to get to, to get to realize that there's things that there's, uh, uh, not just things, but there are uh, uh, talents and giftings that God is giving you so that you could fulfill greater things. Because God does care for me. Because God does provide for me. Now the second thing this morning, stop waiting for what you want and start working with what you have. Stop waiting for what you simply want and start working with what you have. Again, this woman, she said, I have nothing. But Elisha is saying, no, you said you have a small jar of oil. We can work with that. That's what you have. We're going to work with that woman. But she's saying, this is all I got. No, put it to work. It's interesting that olive oil was really valuable at that time. It was used for many things. This wasn't just simply some, some oil. Yes, it was used for cooking, but it was also used for, for lamp burning uh, so that it could keep their lamps burning. You didn't have the, the fire marshal show up back then. Uh, it was, you, you would have lamps all over the house, and it was the olive oil that helped it. It was even used for moisturizer. You, you couldn't just go buy some lotion at Walgreens. No, they would use it for, for, for moisturizer for their hands. And, and uh, uh, it was also used to, to keep metal from rusting and, and some other uh, tools and the things they had. But in religious services, it was also used to anoint people as a representation of the very presence of God, of representation of the Holy Spirit. And so they would anoint them. They would fill with olive oil. They would fill a, a ram's horn. And they would fill that horn and stick their thumb at the end of it. And the prophet would come over and over a king or over a, a new chosen prophet. And they would, they would simply pour the oil on their head. And the oil would, would then go down their face as a representation of the covering of the Holy Spirit. And so that the world and everyone there watching could recognize, okay, that person has been anointed. That person has been chosen. And it's interesting that Jesus, Jesus was named the anointed one. In, in, in Greek, the Christ, the Messiah. In Hebrew, the anointed chosen one. So once again, the problem simply seems so big, but she had all she needed there in her home. Look at verse 3. Elisha said, now take that, okay, take that oil, go around and ask all your neighbors for empty jars. Elisha has some, God uses them for some crazy ideas. Earlier, remember last time he said, go and start digging holes in the desert. <laughs> now he tells this woman, go and start asking all your neighbors for empty jars. Don't ask for just a few. Don't ask for just a few, okay? Make sure you ask for as many as possible. Then go inside, shut the door behind you and your sons, pour oil in all the jars, and, uh, and as each is filled, put it, put it one, uh, put it, put no one, what is it? Put it to one side, excuse me. He told her to take all the jars. He, ta he told her to take all the jars, not just a few. Do we trust God to do greater things in our life? Or are we simply going to be tempted to only just take a few jars? Don't only say, well, maybe, maybe uh, we could help out God. Maybe we could say, well, maybe this is, this is too much, so, so just in case he doesn't fill them all, I won't get too many jars. No, Elisha is, is thinking that God is going to fill up jars for me. 
then I should get just a few. I'll try to help out God. Uh, We will end up getting in the way of God's greatness by limiting Him because of our small thinking sometimes. And we, I've, I hear it sometimes. Oh, well, we're just happy with our little church. We're just happy with the ten of us and five of us. Because, you know, uh, I don't know if we could do that much, but we'll, we'll work with what we have, just, uh, just us here. And, and uh, well, what about evangelism? What about the Great Commission? Well, that's for other churches, not so much for us. And, or, or, or that's for other families. But how about may the Lord bless you, bless your family, take care of you, get you out of these problems, out of these financial needs. Oh yeah, well that's for other people, not so much for us. Uh, We're just from Stockton. We're just from the east side. This is how it's always been for me and for my grandma and and for my grandpa. We've always lived here. This is just how it is. and, and, And so we don't begin, we don't allow God to start saying, God, do greater things in my life. Do greater things with my children. Do greater things in my city. But we sometimes just so focused on trying to help out God by thinking smaller. Or we can be tempted to think that we only have enough oil so I'm not going to fill it up I'm just going to put just a little bit in this jar and maybe a little bit in that jar and just do a little bit because what if what if I run out and there's still so many more uh, uh, jars left but when we trust God that he has power to fill up the jar over and over then there will be greater abundance We need to let God begin to use us to to not only fill a little bit, but say, God, more and more and overflow. Overflow in my family. Overflow with my grandchildren. Overflow in my church. We want more of your presence. More of what you have for us. Then the last point this morning. When you trust God with what you have, God will supply what you need. Trust God with what you have. Throughout Scripture, he simply says, there's many moments, we see it in the life of Moses. He tells Moses, Moses, what is in your hand? And Moses simply says, well, I got a staff here, use that. And it seems so silly, a stick, a shepherd's stick, a shepherd's staff, it wasn't anything special or important. But God used that to do miracles, to show his glory and his power in front of Pharaoh, in front of the greatest, most powerful man at the time. He used a stick. He, as he raised his staff at the, at the, at the end of the, at the beginning there on that beach of that ocean, and as he raised his staff there at the Red Sea, and the waters parted, it was simply had nothing to do with what was in his hands, but it was the faith that he had in God. And sometimes God wants to use simply the, the little things that are there. So again, God will use, he will, he will use what you have, because then he will then give you and supply what you need. Now go to verse 5. She left him. She shut the door behind her and her sons. I love that. I love that he told her to go shut the door and she listens. But I love that she had to shut the door because she didn't want anyone, not even her sons, to come and ask, "Um, what are you doing? (laughs) You always get those people. Why are you doing that though? Why, Why is that? Because this is what God said to do. But it doesn't make sense. This is weird. Why is this happening? Because I'm obeying God to do this and I'm doing this by faith. But why though? You should do this. You should just give up. You should move back to Tucson with your family. You have family here. Why are you spending, wasting your time over there in Stockton? Why are you doing those things? Because this is what God said, period. And finally, I just got to shut the door. And then, so, so this is what... This is what we got to do sometimes. I love it when Jesus was about to go heal this, this girl and, and this, this daughter uh, of Jairus. And, and, and this girl, by this time, he shows up. She's dead in her bedroom. And, I, and same thing. He tells everybody, all the people that are already mourning and saying, God, why? Why has this happened? Why, why, is this, why has all this happened? Where have you been? And then people are mourning and crying and, and being dramatic. And he tells everybody, okay, everybody get out. Get out. Get out of here. We don't need all your negativity right now. Get out of here. Get out of here. All your lack of faith. Get out of here. And he tells uh, uh, Peter, James, and, and John to get, come in with them because they believed. And so they go inside and he tells this girl, wake up. Get up. But he had to get rid of all the negative people. And so this is what he does right here. This this woman, she goes and she shuts the door behind her. Doesn't want anybody to interrupt. So they brought the jars to her and she kept pouring. And she kept pouring. When all the jars were full, she she, she said to her son, bring me another one. Bring me another one. And she replied, there is not a jar left. 
Then it was when the oil finally stopped. When all the jars were full. As she was pouring, she probably, she probably thought, this was so silly. This is so weird. And this is so pointless. But she realized that they were filling up. She, she put her, her, her limited resources in God's hands. And again, God multiplied it. Look at verse, verse 5. She went, or verse 7, she went and told the man of God, and he said, go sell the oil and pay your debts. You and your sons can live on what is left. Go and sell the oil. She went from being broke, from, from having from hopelessness and childless, to now having her own olive oil business. Now she was ready to go and sell it to other people who needed this oil. But this is not just a picture about, about material things. Wow, yes, God, give us that business. Yes, God, financially. Yes, God, multiply the, the finances. No, 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 it's not just about that. And I'm going to ask the worship team to come up as we, we close this morning. Because it wasn't simply just a picture about God meeting material needs. She needed her debt paid. Yes, amen. But this is a picture of the gospel of Jesus Christ. Because she was about to lose everything in her life. She had a debt that she could not pay. And it was Christ, the chosen one. The one that, 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 that paid our debt so that we would not have to pay for it ourselves. That we had to pay for it with our own blood, with our own death. But He went and paid for it ourself, Himself for us. You see, we're, we're, we can't just stop there. We could have just simply stopped there at the moment and said, wow, look at the great miracle, the way God multiplied it for this woman. And now she doesn't have to give up her, her sons. And now she has extra money. And now she's going to be able to provide for the rest of her life and, and have enough oil. And God's going to keep multiplying. And we could have just stopped there. Wow, yes, provision, money, yes. No, but no. Again, it's about Jesus. It's about the gospel. And it's a reminder that in our need, in our debt, in what we could not pay for ourselves because we were hopeless, God, the chosen, anointed one, He was crushed. He was broken so that He could fill us. So that we can be redeemed. So that we could be paid for. But He wants to fill us. Because He doesn't want to simply remove, He wants to fill us. So we need to empty all of ourselves. We need to become these empty vessels that must be filled. 2 Timothy chapter 2, verse 20. But in a great house, there are not only vessels of gold and silver, but also wood and clay, some for honor and some for dishonor. We need to empty ourselves of anything that will dishonor Him, that will dishonor God, so that we may be filled. If we're saying, God, this is what I have. This is who I am, God. Use this. This is all I got. You got my heart. You got my hands. You have my voice, my feet. Use me, Lord. And He's saying, I will use you. But you have to carry your cross. You have to empty yourself. You have to die of yourself. I want to I wanna help you, but you have to be completely reborn. Now, I don't know what you need this morning, but God cares and God provides. And God will multiply it and use it in ways that you can't even imagine. But this, is, this picture here is not just about ourselves. It's not just, yes, Lord, you came, you died for my sins, you paid for my sins, so I wouldn't have to pay for it myself. It's not just that, because He wants to fill us. He wants to anoint us. Because this picture here is also about evangelism, about sharing the gospel, of sharing what we got. We need to be filled so we could go fill. Every day we must allow God to fill us, be filled so that you could go fill. Be filled with more and more of what He has for you. He wants to overflow in your life. He wants to overflow so you could have more than enough to go share what we got. Because there are thousands of empty vessels out there. And we can't limit God and say, well, how about just a few, God? Because what if, what if, what if, what if? No. He's saying, go get them all. 
Go get them all. Go get all the vessels and fill them with the anointing that you have. Fill them with the blessing that you've received from me because we are responsible of taking Jesus to them, filling them with Jesus. And again, He will overflow. He will overflow. He will just, He will do what only He can do But again, these stories are showing us that there is something that we have to do before the miracle. She could have simply believed, but no, she got out of her problem, stopped focusing on the problem right now, and went and got more vessels, went and got more jars. She went and filled up the house. And she went and did it knowing that God's going to do it. We need to fill up the house with vessels. He's going to pour the oil in them. We're not going to do that. But we need to do it. We need to do what we can do. And then He'll do the rest. Amen. Now I can only imagine that when, how that woman's house must have looked that day. Before she began pouring, she may have lined up all the empty vessels to be filled. And, and different kinds of vessels. They're, they're, they're of all shapes and sizes. Empty flower pots probably. Maybe she got trash cans. Maybe she got old wineskins. Maybe she got all different types. But, but it must have been so strange to look at. They were all just lined up there. And, I, I, and, and I've been at moments in meetings, in, in, in services, in these beautiful Holy Ghost meetings like this that look like this before. You're not sure of what God is going to do and, 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 and will He actually be able to have enough oil to pour on everyone that's there. But when, when the Holy Spirit begins to move, when He begins to move and begin to touch, oh, the whole house becomes filled by His presence. The, 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 the oil is just, this, this oil is ready to be poured out. This, this oil was so expensive back then. It, was, it meant so much back then. This oil has cost. There is a moment before Christ went to the cross that He is in the Garden of Gethsemane, a garden of olive trees, that He later becomes that crushed oil, just like an olive is crushed and squeezed and and it becomes this oil that he himself there as he was on the floor crying. And it says that his, his sweat was as drops of blood falling to the ground. And as he calls on his father and says, God, may not my will be done, Father, but your will be done. At that moment, his soul, his spirit, knowing what he was going to go through at the cross, I really believe that by when he got to the cross, he had made his mind up. But it was there at the garden where he was suffering, where it was heart-wrenching knowing what he was going to go through. But he said, do it, Lord. This oil cost us. This oil was crushed for us. This morning, this morning, don't wait What God has for you is very precious and will only keep pouring until every vessel is full right up to the brim. Not a drop of the oil of the Holy Spirit is to be wasted. God is ready to pour out. Are you ready to receive this morning? Are you simply going to be an empty vessel so that He could fill you this morning? This morning as we give up these these 21 days, let there be a purpose for all this. It's not just simply, even though God has healed in the past 21 days, God has provided new jobs and positions the last 21 days. God has done great, miraculous financial and, and, and physical needs the last 21 days. But let it be for more than that. Let it be so that we could be prepared these 21 days for the next 365 so that the rest of this year we could continue to go and bring those vessels in. But you need the anointing. You need the touch of God. So this morning like never before, let's not waste any time. Why don't we run to this altar? Why don't we run up to this?